Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let me encourage you, if you will, to take a Bible and open it with me to the New Testament book of Romans chapter 8. We will be reading in just a few moments from Romans chapter 8. If you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one very close to you beneath the row of chairs in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, we would encourage you to take one off of one of the tables there in the foyer. We have red hardback ones there that are free for the taking. We're so very thankful that you're here this morning. And as we open up God's Word and listen to it, we want to keep that great chorus at the forefront of our minds. Holy, holy, holy. What we are reading this morning or words breathed out by God Himself. We want to treat them as such. What we hold in our hands is the greatest, most wonderful story of love that this world has ever seen and will ever see. We talked a little bit last Sunday morning about the fact that there are aspects of that story there is a key character within that story that we don't spend a lot of time talking about. And we want to do that a little bit more this morning. Before we get into that, let me encourage you to take one of these little cards, at least one, as many of them as you can possibly use out of the foyer this morning. We've got a very special uh, topic that we want to talk about, Lord willing, on September 23rd, three weeks away from this morning. And we've got several hundred cards on the table in the foyer that are advertising that. Lord willing, at 1030 on September 23rd, we're going to talk about the top five things your kids need to know about the Bible or your grandkids, or the, the kids of a, a, an aunt, or an uncle, or a niece, or a nephew, or a friend, or a co-worker, whomever it is. We want to talk about the top five things that kids need to know about the Bible. That's at 10.30 on September 23rd, and we want to do everything that we can to spread the word about that. And invite as many people as possible. And so please be sure to get as many of those as you are able to distribute before you leave this morning. We'll hear more about that as the next couple of weeks move along. We mentioned last Sunday morning that God the Father is often talked about and often sung about. And God the Son is often talked about and studied about and sung about. We spent a little bit of time in talking about, last Sunday morning, three, not two, but three distinct different personalities that share what the Apostle Paul describes as the divine nature. The one personality within that great an awesome triune God is the Holy Spirit that does not get a, a great deal of publicity or at least nearly as much attention as God the Father and God the Son. And we said last Sunday morning that we want to continue talking a little bit more. And this morning simply asking the question, what or 
who is the Holy Spirit. And one of the best things that we can do when we want to get to know someone, maybe that we don't know all that well, is just to listen. And to soak in as much detail, as much description about that one, we want to get to know better as humanly possible. And so this morning, we're going to do a lot of listening. I'm going to do maybe less talking than I typically do off the top of my head, and we're going to do more reading and and referencing this morning, and that's a good thing. Because what we're reading and referencing this morning are the words of God. And they are important because ignorance and confusion and misconceptions abound when we talk about the Holy Spirit. One of the the guiding compass points for our time this morning, I would suggest to you a very good compass point. It is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 where Paul says that the natural person, the person who is just living without any regard for God, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so what we want to talk about this morning are spiritual things, and we want to use the Word of God to make sure that we are discerning everything that God has possibly revealed about God the Spirit. We can't look into creation for details about God the Spirit. And what you and I think and conjecture in and of ourselves is worthless concerning the Spirit of God especially when God Himself has spoken. This awesome being is described throughout God's book in a variety of different ways. Number one, the Spirit of God. We'll be there in Romans chapter 8 in just a few moments. Notice with me a couple of other references before that. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we read that right there at the beginning of creation... The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Shortly after he was anointed as king of Israel, Saul comes to Gibeah with a group of people and there is a group of prophets that need him and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul and he prophesied among those prophets. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, we read about the baptism of Jesus and how immediately as He comes up out of the water, having been baptized, the heavens were opened and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on Him. But this is much more than just, well, this is something that happened a long time ago without any real relevance for you and for me. Look with me in your Bibles at Romans chapter 8 and the ninth verse of the chapter where Paul addresses Christians and he says, You, however, are not in the flesh. We think back to where we began in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You now are concerned about the things of God and trying to build your lives on the things of God. You're not in the flesh but in the Spirit if in fact The Spirit of God dwells in you. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, he says, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. In Philippians 3 and verse 3, we are the circumcision. Now we are the people of God, whether Jew or Gentile, male or female, as Christians, we who worship by the Spirit of God. Listen to what God is communicating this morning. The Spirit needs to be involved in your worship. Lord willing, we'll continue to talk about exactly what this is all about and what this means. Right now, we're just trying to get to know Him. 
We who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we will be in just a few moments. He is described one time in the Bible as the eternal Spirit. He is God, as we established last Sunday morning. More than any other way in the Bible, He is described as not just the Spirit or any Spirit, but as the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus promised His apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. We read of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 who was full of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, the apostles in Jerusalem heard that those in Samaria had received the Word of God. The Gospel has spread north of Jerusalem. And so they send Peter and John who come down into Samaria and they pray for those people that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For He had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus then those apostles laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Again, as time allows, we want to talk about exactly what that means from a biblical standpoint. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul exclaims, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We are told about the kingdom of which we are a part in Romans 14, that it is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where you have your Bibles open in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and the 19th verse of the chapter, the question of Christians is asked, don't you know this? We need to hear this at the beginning of this week where we go out and begin to make choices that will either exalt God or shame our calling. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. He is described by God the Son. The Spirit is described by God the Son as the Spirit of truth, especially in this section of the Gospel of John. Jesus promises His closest of followers in John 14 and verse 16, I will ask the Father and He will give you, in the language of verse 17, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him for He dwells with you and will be in you. A page or two over in John 16 and verse 13. The promise remains. Jesus continues to talk with His apostles and He tells them, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will declare to you, the apostles, the things that are to come. Back in John 14, he is described as the helper. John 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. God the Son is speaking. God the Father is going to do the sending in the name of God the Son. And God the Spirit will serve as a helper to these men. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He tells them in chapter 16 that these men who do not want to see Jesus leave them, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, 
I will send him to you. One thing comes through loud and clear. When we read of him as the Spirit of God, the eternal Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the help, it becomes abundantly clear. We're not talking about an it. Not what, but who. He is not some sort of an impersonal force in the world. You turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8 and the 26th verse of the chapter. Paul reveals for us by inspiration of God in Romans 8 and verse 26 that the Spirit has a mind. In verse 27, Paul says, He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has a will. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, all these gifts that Paul is describing and defining and regulating for those early Christians, he says these are all empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one, not what, not coincidentally, but who apportions to each one individually as He, the Spirit, wills. Turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew 12 where we will read together in just a few moments. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. As God, He is omnipresent. It is the psalmist who asks in Psalm 139 in verse 7, Where shall I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And he describes everywhere that can come to mind. There's nowhere I can go that the Spirit of God is not. In Nehemiah chapter 9, he is described as the good Spirit. Just as God is good and does good, the Spirit who is God is good and does good. We've got our Bibles open there to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22. The Son of God describes the Holy Spirit in the context of this great struggle that is going on between some who believe that He is the Christ and some who do not. In Matthew 12 and verse 22, Matthew tells us that a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and Jesus healed him so that this man who formerly was not able to see or to speak now could speak and see. And all of the people, as you can imagine, are amazed and they ask the question, can this be the one we've been looking for, the son of David? There are those, the Pharisees, who hear it and say, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man, Jesus, casts out demons knowing their thoughts. Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God, almost the exact language in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, where Luke records this as the finger of God. If by the Spirit of God, who is the finger of God, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He has a mind. He has a will. He is everywhere. He is good. He is the very 
finger of God. We turn in our Bibles back to the book of Romans chapter 15 and the 30th verse of the chapter. Not only are we told a little bit about who this is, but we are told about His actions. And that helps us to learn a little bit more about who He is and what He is all about. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 30, the Holy Spirit loves. Paul appeals to these brethren in Rome by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 13 where we will be in just a moment. The Holy Spirit speaks. Listen to just a small cross-section of what we could point out from the New Testament especially. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says, It was the Spirit in Acts 8 who told Philip, You go and you start talking to this Ethiopian eunuch. It was the Spirit in Acts chapter 10 who said to Peter, There are people from Cornelius' household who are coming to see you. The Holy Spirit bears witness. Jesus promised in John chapter 15 and verse 26, When this Helper comes, whom I, God the Son, will send to you from God the Father, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He, the Spirit, will bear witness about me. And listen to me once again. This is about so much more than, well, that the Spirit did something long ago, but really this doesn't have very much at all to do with you and me. Not at all. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. This Spirit intercedes. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, He helps us. Shouldn't we get to know Him? He helps us. Maybe we've never even thought about what He is doing in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. I don't know about you, but I certainly can relate to that. But the Spirit, not itself, Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He searches. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10, He searches everything. It is He who searches even the depths of God. He makes decisions. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 15, historically, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We've got our Bibles open to Acts chapter 13. The Holy Spirit leads. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, there are those saints in the city of Antioch who are worshiping the Lord and fasting. And Luke tells us, The Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Not only does He lead, but He overrules human actions. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, Luke says they, Paul and his companions, went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Just as God the Son promised, the Holy Spirit convicts. Jesus said in John 16 and verse 8, When He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Finally, under this heading, it is the Spirit who invites. 
the Bible closes. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Turn with me, if you will, very quickly to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Because the Holy Spirit is God, and because He is the Spirit of truth, and because He invites, listen to me this morning, you will interact with Him in one way or another. This very morning. Lord willing, in in the weeks to come, we'll talk about in more detail some of the ways that interaction with the Spirit is going on. But in a very real sense, the Holy Spirit of God can be grieved. And God is saying to me and He is saying to you this morning in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, do not grieve. There are parents and grandparents in this room who know what it means to be grieved by the decisions of their children and grandchildren. God says to all of us this morning, at the beginning of this new week, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And he goes on to talk about what you allow to take root in your heart this week will bring the joy to the Spirit of God or the grief to the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God can be outraged. And we all know we don't want to outrage our bosses this week. And we don't want to outrage our spouses this week. And we don't want to outrage our our parents this week. We don't want to outrage our closest of friends. But listen to me. That is nothing compared to outraging the Spirit of God. In Hebrews 10 and verse 29, the question is asked, of how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who knows and has responded to the good news and trampled under their selfish feet by the way that they live, the Son of God, and take the blood by which they were washed clean and profane it. And when we do that, the Spirit of grace is outraged. Lord willing, we will talk before this study is done of how the Holy Spirit of God can be blasphemed against. Words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 get the attention of many, many people. Last Sunday morning we talked about how the Holy Spirit of God can be lied to. We read about a man and his wife who did that in Acts chapter 5. Finally, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, the Holy Spirit will be listened to, received as worth my time and attention and obedience, or He will be resisted. In the message that ultimately led to His death, Stephen boldly stood up against rebellious religious men and said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you 
always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. And listen to me. If the Holy Spirit could be grieved then, He can be grieved now. If the Holy Spirit can be outraged by my manner of life, could be then, He can be now. If He can be blasphemed against and lied to, that's something that we need to think about. And this very morning, His message will be received or resisted. We have gathered this morning in hope because there is a God and He has spoken and He has reached out to us. And as we sing this song, if you know that you are alienated from Him, listen to the language of Scripture and appreciate the fact that from the Lord Jesus Christ, grace is available. And from God the Father, Love is available. And from the Holy Spirit of God, fellowship, welcoming, relationship is available. If you've been moved to ask like so many were moved to ask in the New Testament, what do I need to do? We encourage you to listen to God. Allow Him to answer that question. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Maybe that's a great description of your past week. Or the way you have spent the first eight months of 2012. There is good news. The goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior has appeared. Salvation is available. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's exactly what Jesus described in John 3 as being born of water and the Spirit. It's what Peter and the apostles were prescribing in Acts 2. When asked, what shall we do? They told that audience, repent and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. God's grace richly has been poured out through Jesus our Savior so that ordinary, sinful, selfish human beings might be justified by His grace, that we might serve as heirs, heirs of God, according to the hope of eternal life. We're going to see there is a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord when the call of His Spirit is lost. If in any way we can help you in responding to the call of the Spirit of God this morning, we encourage you to come to the front of this auditorium while we stand and sing.